All right, everybody, welcome to credit, maintaining your credit score. We're going to go ahead and get the webinar started. Uh, just for you to know, this is going to be recorded. It is being recorded, and then we'll give it uh, to all the attendees. We'll, we'll send it out to you guys. So a uh, couple of housekeeping things. There definitely is uh, room for questions. There's a chat button. If there's anything you need to tell me, like if you can't hear me or anything, I'm using a new microphone today. So uh, if you need anything, just chat. And if you have questions, please feel free to chat. So there's two, two to three places in the webinar that I've I'm going to stop and pause and ask questions, but you know, definitely feel free to raise your hand before then, and then we'll we'll pick it up at the at the places that we've got designated. Okay, so credit maintaining or increasing your score during your home search, or even if you're not searching for a home, you definitely uh, could utilize some of these tips. Okay. So uh, we're going to get to the first slide here. So just a little bit about my expertise and why I'm qualified to teach this topic. I have been in the industry for 24 years, very, very full time. I've personally originated over 3,500 loans. I actually counted last month. I was like, I'm just curious how many that I've done. So it's been quite a bit. Uh, helped a lot of clients. And we pull as a team now, we pull about 50 credit reports a month. So I really, really have made myself an expert on knowing how credit moves and I'm always learning because the algorithm, I mean, it's, it's not as complicated as, you know, social media algorithms and codes. It seems like that's always changing. Uh, credit doesn't change that often, but there are, you're going to see in the presentation, there's lots of different models of FICO scores. So we're going to go through that um, in a minute. Um, and we're only referrals. So we are, I'm really invested in being the expert because I want clients and realtors to refer us again. So I believe that that uh, qualifies me to talk about this. So thanks for joining us today. So first we're going to go through what is a score. Okay. So Wikipedia says that a score is a numerical expression based on a level analysis of a person's credit files to represent the credit worthiness of an individual. A credit score is primarily based on a credit report information typically sourced from the credit bureaus. In short, uh, it's an algorithm that spits out, it takes data and it spits out the score. Okay, so we're gonna learn a little bit more about the history here in a second. So, history. Um, credit dates back to the 1800s. I was reading this up on the internet, uh, you know, just not automated, obviously, but people having credit, um, businesses having, having credit and, and, and worthiness, uh, where their word helped them with, with past experience. So fast forward to 1970, the Fair Credit Reporting Act was passed and it required the uh, bureaus at that time, they were named something different. There was actually a big one called RCC, and they mandated that they open files of people's credit worthiness to the public. Apparently, it was private back then. It's like a deep, dark secret. So RCC later changed their name to Equifax, and then later in years that ensued, Experian and TransUnion evolved into the world. Okay, so. Then in 1989, almost 20 years later, the industry, you know, so these three bureaus, uh, oh, excuse me one second, we have something weird here. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean for that to happen. Uh, these three bureaus were evolving and they weren't consistent. And so what happened is, is they all looked for some commonality. And so there was a company at the time called Fair Isaac and Company, and they were a tech company that was, you know, 30, 40 years old at the time. And they had this algorithm that had designed that could take the data and spit it out. So that's when the FICO score was born. FICO stands for Fair Isaac and Company. And that's today, it's a trademark name. FICO score is the Fair Isaac and Company. And that's the score. It's used in over 90% of uh, lending. So almost everybody uses the FICO score, but what you're going to see on another slide is not all FICO scores are the same. Okay. So that's super, super important. 
Uh, so here I thought it was interesting. I wanted to show you all these different, you know, you can search online and see all these pie charts and what is a component of your score. One says 10%, one says 1%, one says 30, 35 for different, different components of your credit. Well, I can tell you these are all, all these pie charts are different and all the different scoring models that you guys hear of are different. So it's important for you to know not all FICO scores are created equal. So I wanted to show you, I actually snapshotted, I took this picture from FICO.com. My FICO.com is the best hands down uh, website that we have found that really gives you super accurate data. If you do pull your credit through my FICO, it is the most closely resembled to a mortgage credit score. So I just want you to see here, look at all these versions of credit. I mean, it blows your mind. And so mortgage lenders are required to all use the same version. And so we have to, but a lot of the online uh, scores that you get from your credit card or you get from Credit Karma, they are not all created equal. So I think it's really important to state that that's why when you call a mortgage company and they pull your credit, that is exactly why we very many times have a different score because we don't know what FICO score they're using. I mean, you can see here, there's an auto score, there's a bank card score, there's all these different versions, okay? So it's super, super important. Uh, as you get more detailed and get a newer score, it costs more money. So it would make sense that these online portals are also for profit and they're trying to get money from you. And so they want to get away with a score that's as cheap as possible, just to give you a, a feel for your generic credit health. So I think it's just really important for you to know that, that not all scores are created equal. Okay. So definitely there's probably going to be some questions uh, around that. Okay. Uh, we're going to go through the truth about credit inquiries and what they are and what they're not, because that does help you understand how to maintain and increase your score. It's right along the topic. Okay. So we went over and everyone knows, I think that there's only three bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. The modeling system that we use, uh, the credit score range is from 350 to 850. Okay. There's no other range. Now, some of the stuff that you can get online, you have to watch out because they're, highest score is 950. There's, that's a popular one. I can't remember which website it is, but uh, you know, their range is different. So their 700 score is really like our 600 score almost. Um, we in lending and mortgage lending, we use the middle of the three credit scores. So uh, we don't average them. We just take the middle of the three. Um, my FICO, we mentioned there's the website. If you do want to go and, and get some really good information about credit. Um, here's the most important part, truth about credit inquiries. Any inquiries in a, uh, it's actually 30, I need to change that. In a 30 day period now count as one. It used to be 45 a year or so ago. So it is 30. Uh, however, in a 45 day period, your, your score will not change because of that inquiry for 45 days. So I want to really pause here and just make sure that it's understood that um, in a 30 day period, you can pull your credit with as many mortgage lenders as you want, one, five, six, or seven, uh, and it will only count as one hard pull. Yes, it's a hard pull. However, if your credit is really strong, that hard pull is going to barely count for any points. So inquiries is actually only 10% of the score. It's a really, really low portion. So the higher your credit, the less impact. If your credit is in the high 700s, it's going to affect your score maybe two or three points, just not very much at all. So I thought that was worth mentioning. I'm going to pause here to see if there's any questions so far. 
um, with anybody. So I'll just uh, hang out for a second, see if there's any questions, and then I will move on. Okay, there don't seem to be any yet. No one's typing. All right, not a problem. All right, what is a good score? So it, let's say that we compared scores to, to, to a tier system. Uh, this is what it would look like. So the highest tier being tier one, anything above 760 is for our purposes, the very best score. So you could have an 800 or an 850, perfect, perfect score, which I've never seen, by the way. I've seen an 840, but I've never seen an 850. Um, then 760 plus, is it's all the same. And then it goes downwards, and you'll notice that it's in buckets of 19 points. So at every 20 points, it's it's almost like you're in a you're just in a tier. Okay, that's why I'm calling it a tier. And so when we are pricing the loan, it's very very susceptible, depending on which tier you fall in, how your interest rate and your credit score, uh, your PMI, if you have PMI, is determined. So it's very very susceptible. The only loan that really is not susceptible to these tiers is FHA, which we'll, we'll go over that briefly um, here in another slide. But here's, this is, this is it right here. And so again, we take the middle of the three scores and that decides which, which tier you're in, okay? All right, we're gonna move on. So in mortgage lending, just wanted to repeat if, if you're watching this and you're thinking of buying a home. So conventional loans are, less than or equal to 484350 in our market here in Houston. Um, if you put down at least 20%, you can have a 620 score. And again, we take the middle of the, of the three. Uh, and then 640, if you have PMI, 640 is the minimum. I will tell you that if you have anything below a 700 in a conventional loan, you really get hammered on the rate and the PMI, but I mean, they're available definitely, but you know, it's, it's, it's really just make sure your ex expectation is not that you're going to get the very best rate. Cause it's, it just, it doesn't work that way. Um, the better rates and PMI are for loans usually that are in the 700s, really above 740, but, but we definitely can loan, to anyone that's got at least a 640 uh, with PMI. Now, if you can do an FHA loan, the max loan amount for that is 330.050. Uh, anything above a 640 for FHA is completely the same rate and everything. If you're 580 to 639, there are some higher rates in that, but you know, again, uh, even a slightly higher rate, getting into an appreciating asset is a great deal. So we could talk about that offline, but I just wanted to give you all the, the bullet points. Uh, if you're getting a jumbo loan, you really need to have above a 720. I don't have anything that prices below 720 on a jumbo loan. Um, there are some lenders out there that have different scoring requirements that might, it's usually kind of your smaller portfolio local banks that will do that. Um, but for the most part, the stuff with the better rates is gonna be 720 and above. So any questions about that? Okay, we don't have any questions. So, but just remember you can feel free to hit the chat button. Okay. All right. So just to give you a gauge for how many points we're talking about for things. And again, the number of points is not an exact science. I give ranges because it really depends. It's almost, it. unfortunately or fortunately, the lower your score is, the more impact and points something an event will take away. So on collections, I have seen a collection uh, impact a score 50 or 60 points, and I've seen it affect 100 points. It depends on some other factors like time. So the more recent the collection, the more impact on the score. If I'm pulling your credit now in October, and the collection just hit your credit last month, it's probably gonna be 100 points different. Uh, if it was a year ago, it might be 50. So time or seasoning where you've had time to, to show us and show the modeling system that you have other accounts that are good uh, to bring that up, the, the score impact becomes less and less. 
lates and tax liens, uh, you know, late payments, tax liens, lates, tax liens, and collections are all in the same point bucket for the most part, as far as it's just a delinquency. It doesn't, the scoring system does not have any judgment as far as differentiating between it's a collection, a late tax lien bankruptcy, like there's no distinguishing factor. It's a derogatory. That's how the, the algorithm feeds it. Okay. Um, so on your balances, on your credit card balances, maintaining uh, less than 30% of your limit is ideal. Okay. So 30% balance versus your limit is the ideal place to be. Okay. Um, not having any more than three credit cards uh, definitely is the key. We see some people, and I'll go over this in some later slides about some of the myths of credit, uh, but it is not a good thing to have a bunch of credit cards. So two to three is the ideal number. Um, if you have more than one inquiry in the last 90 days, you will have some points taken away. Uh, the most impact, if you have inquiries from many different sources, like let's say you have a mortgage lender and then you have a light bill and then you have, you're trying to get a Best Buy credit card and then you have a car inquiry. So when you have many different kinds of inquiries in a really short period of time, what that's telling the algorithm that's, that's weighing all this data, it's telling it that, oh, this person must be broke because they have all these inquiries. So we're just gonna dive the score downwards so that the lender will pay attention and take, take aware before they lend to this person. That's exactly how the, the score works, okay? Um, but an isolated inquiry here and there is not gonna hurt you. Now, if you have a new account with less than, 20, than 12 months reviewed, then you do get some points taken away. Um, the reason is because there hasn't been enough of a track record on that account to show that you're paying them on time. So let's say that you have 10 years of excellent credit and then you have two new accounts. I mean, yes, you have all that great credit, which is factoring into your score. However, the new credit, what if your habits have changed? What if your, what if your financial situation has changed? And so the jury is still out on these two new credit cards that you just took out. So there are some points taken away and then they are given back at 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. So in groupings of 12, as your accounts season, you get more and more points back. So ideally, if you're gonna close a credit card, do not close the one that's got like 90 months reviewed or 99. When you see 99 on your credit report, it's because it just, they only, it, allow two digits. So if it's older than 99 months, the, the system just cuts it off. It's just, that's like 99 months is the Mecca of credit. Okay. That's fantastic. So the people that get in the 800s, I can tell you that they get there by having more seasoned credit and more accounts with 99 months in them. That's how they get it. Okay. That's, that's the pattern that, that we see. Okay. Just to let you know. Uh, let's see. Okay, any questions? Again, I keep checking the chat button here on my end to see if there's any questions. And if there are, I'll stop and share. Okay, tips to maintaining your credit score. So look for errors on your credit, you know, do get your credit, um, you know, your credit. My free credit is, is great to do. They usually only give you one bureau because they want you to upgrade to the other two. Remember, it's a, it's a profit-making, money-making system. Uh, again, if you're gonna pay for it, I personally would do it through myfico.com. It is, I believe, the very best, uh, most model that most resembles um, uh, the ones that mortgage lenders use if, if you're trying to get a mortgage. Uh, keep your revolving balances less than 30% of the limit. We did go over that. I am going to go a little more specific into that. I just, I'm, I'm going to stop here for a second and tell you that uh, when your credit card is reported monthly, that's where the 30% or whatever percent is calculated. Many people say to me, oh, well, I pay that off monthly. 
So let's say their limit's like 10,000 and it's charged at 9999 because they want to get the points. They've got airline points and everything else, which is fantastic. However, when your statement cuts off, like my Chase statements cuts off on the 9th. I don't know why they don't do it on the 31st, but it's the 9th, okay? So on the 9th, whatever my credit card balance is on that day is what reports to the bureaus. And they report it because your payment's not due until three weeks later. And what if on this one month you decide I'm only going to pay the minimum payment? I'm telling like I'm tempted every month. Sometimes when I have a really high bill because whatever Christmas or whatever, I am tempted to make the minimum monthly payment. So I don't, I have for the last 10 years, never paid just the minimum payment. However, I've been tempted. So that's why the credit bureau does that because from one month to the next, you could change your mind. And so they report the balance as of the last statement. So just so you know, that is the number one fix when I see clients credit and we're trying to get the score up to what I know that their score should be is we pay down debt and then we do a rescore. So just to let you know, there's, there's ways, that's like the easiest thing to fix is credit card debt if, if the client has the money, of course. Um, okay, going to credit cards again, the ideal credit combination is one or two installment accounts, which is installment accounts are things that most closely resemble a mortgage, like it's a car payment, or let's say you bought furniture and they have regular installments and your payment is $175 a month every single month. So it's not a revolving debt, it's not a charge card, but it's an installment contract. That, that student loans are installment, okay? And then two, maybe three revolving cards, that's a credit card like Best Buy, Macy's, Kohl's, Target, whatever, Visa, Gas, those are all revolving type credit cards. You can charge them up and pay them down, charge them up and pay them down, and they always have a limit, okay? So that's what we mean when we talk about uh, credit cards, revolving balances. Um, and then we, we mentioned before about the 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. So Seasoning, sometimes the fix for credit when we're looking at people's credit report is you just have several new accounts and they just need to season. We just need time uh, if that, in fact, is, is what they need if we don't have any other solution for them. Okay. Uh, we did have a question, so I'm going to go ahead and get that. How do you challenge something on your credit? That was... Perfect question. So how do you challenge something on your credit? Um, thank you for that question. You can either go to the website of the three bureaus. That's probably the best way. Uh, if you call the creditors directly, they will likely not get, you won't get anywhere. Uh, sometimes we advise people to do that, to call the creditor directly, like if it's, if it's removing a collection or something. But the, the best way also is to write uh, send snail mail uh, certified to the three credit bureaus, Equifax, TransUnion, or Experian, or you can go to their websites, create a login for free, and you can challenge it that way. So in this day and age, I think electronic is probably best, but you certainly don't have to. So uh, their websites are Equifax.com, Experian.com, and TransUnion.com. Okay, so you can get those addresses there uh, and then also get online and do that. So um, if that didn't answer your question, just ping me back and we'll answer it. That was a great question. Okay, uh, comment, we're gonna go over some common myths about credit. So if multiple, number one is if multiple mortgage companies pull my credit, my score will go way down. That is not accurate. As I mentioned in a couple of slides ago, it depends on number one, uh, how strong your score is to begin with. Number two, what other kind of things are you doing with your credit? If, this is, if it's just one isolated score, uh, score pull and there's not a lot of other activity, you're not getting other new credit or you're not having a bunch of other inquiries of different kinds at the same time, like trying to get a car, trying to get a, increase your credit limit, you know, those are different kinds of inquiries, then your score is, is going to just barely change. It's going to be less than five points. Um, so number one is not always, that's not always accurate. 
Okay, number two, a big myth is you should never close an account. That might have been in the, in the past. I remember when I first got in the business in 95, that was something that was going around, but I can tell you that no one really knew because no one back at that in the 90s, we weren't that computerized and no one really, computer, computer reports and, and credit came over for me when I was first in the mortgage business, still on those, that green and white paper with the brads on it. And there was that machine, that dot matrix machine, like it, we had to order the credit and someone had to manually call the bureaus and get the credit. Like it was super archaic. Okay. So back then maybe, but now fast forward, you should only have that mixture of a couple of credit cards that I mentioned. So having a bunch of cards out there lingering is not a good idea because the way the algorithm is tweaked to think is that if you were to lose your job, you could essentially, if you have 10 cards with all these different limits, you could essentially go out and just live on credit and, you know, in the short term, charge up your credit cards, but then you wouldn't be able to pay them. So when you have a lot of available credit, it is just as harmful as having either no credit or maxed out credit. Okay. So be careful on that. Uh, number three, it's okay to have multiple credit cards because they have a zero balance. That again, when I just mentioned, you have the propensity to be in debt overnight. If you were to lose your job, that number two and three are related. That's not a good thing. Um, number four, I pay off credit cards monthly, so my score should be great. Not necessarily. Uh, what I was talking about a few minutes ago, as far as your your balance on your credit card cutoff date is that's what's reported to the bureau. So if the balance, let's say your limit's 10,000 and your balance that you report, because you are trying to really max out those points and get airline points, you were at like 9,500. So you were topped out. That month, if anyone pulls your score, your score will be low because you have almost 100% utilized credit card. So number four is, it depends. It depends what your balance to limit ratio is. Percent utilization is a very big part of your score. It's like 30% of your score is percent utilization of individual cards, okay? Um, number five, the collection is small. Uh, if you have a collection like, oh yeah, it was only 50 bucks, you know, late payment on the cable or whatever, so it shouldn't matter. That is not the case. Uh, any collection, no matter how big or how small, has the same number of points associated with it. So it's not the dollar amount that's calculating an algorithm. It's the act of delinquency. So that is what is super, super important that people don't know. So uh, the question that we had earlier about cleaning up your score, the first place to start is, if you do have a collection, is to um, go directly to the source. You have to go to the collection company, not the AT&T. For example, let's say it was AT&T Wireless. Well, AT&T has already relinquished it over to the credit bureau, uh, to the collection company. So they're, they're like, it's out of our hands. We don't care. It's the collection company that you need to dispute that with. Um, and essentially get them to remove it. The only way that it's going to improve your score is to get it completely deleted from your credit report, which sometimes that's super hard to do. Um, so what we see clients able to do is, you know, able to settle, like maybe they'll settle for half or something and, but they'll do it and say, well, we'll only do that if you give me a letter saying, you know, that this is going to be deleted. So just a little sidestep there. Um, we do have a question. Is there a certain percent you should use of your credit on your credit card? For example, if I have a 10,000 limit, is there a certain percentage? Yes. Um, the percentage is 30%. That is ideal uh, to be less than 30%. So if you have the $10,000 limit, when your credit statement turns off, so on the 9th, when my Chase card reports, you know, end of the month, Whatever the balance is on that date is what's reported. So if you're trying to buy a house, what I'll tell people is, look, 
spend the money, get the points, whatever you want to do, go in five or seven days prior, pay it down to 3000, let it report 3000 because having a zero balance is just as dangerous uh, because then you have no credit. So um, let it report the 3000 and then just, you know, pay it when it's due. Okay. So that's kind of a trick that you can, that you can do. So that was a really excellent question. Um, credit, credit is super mysterious, but I think if you know the, um, I think if you know just those few ins and outs of just the basics and keep it super simple, it's not that scary. So just to, just to recap, um, well, I want to recap here on this maintaining your credit card and debt. You know, you always want to get a copy of your credit report to look for some errors. Uh, when you are buying a house, it's okay that 8 to 15% of your income is towards other debt for the most part, okay? Um, and then you want to keep your cap balances at 30% of the available credit. No new open trades. Really watch that and watch your mail for anything that could turn into collections. So this is kind of in summary, the things that I want you to watch for, okay? To keep your credit in good standing. I mean, really the most, the two most common point busters that we see is credit card balances and collections. So if you can control those two things, then your credit score is gonna start getting back on the men. So if, if you, if your credit is lower because of those things, sometimes only time will heal that because if the collection is there, it's very difficult to get it off. It's not impossible, but it's super difficult. And sometimes people just go through hard times. Um, but the balances, um, that's a big, big, big thing. And sometimes it just takes time on that as well. Um, so we counsel people if it's worth it to, you know, cash in on a 401k and pay it off or whatever. So we can always go through that. Uh, I wanted to, to end, end the uh, webinar with a funny joke. I saw this Jackie Chan meme and he's like, oh my God, we had it clear to close and you went and applied for a Kohl's credit card. So when we're doing the mortgage, something that we see not all the time, because we want to coach people before this happens, but you know, we'll be set to close and everything is good. And then two to three days prior to the closing, we have to check and see if the client has any new debt. So we, we rerun, uh, we have to do, it's a soft pull, but we rerun the credit to see if there's any inquiries. Um, and we've had people do all kinds of things, but you know, this, that's the joke is that, oh my God, they went out and took out a Kohl's credit card or charged up all their cards and bought furniture or whatever it is. So that's why I thought that meme was so very funny. Um, so these are just some things not to do if you are buying a house. Don't open new trades. Don't get credit line increases. Don't do inquiries with, with other than mortgage type companies. Don't spend excessive money on a credit card and don't purchase furniture or appliances before closing. So all these things will keep you in the safe zone. Okay. So I hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Um, if you have any, you know, further questions outside of this, you can always email me here at jennifer.hernandez at legacymutual.com. I'd be happy to answer and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for stopping in. Legacy Mutual Mortgage is an equal housing opportunity lender. The opinions expressed here do not reflect those of Legacy Mutual Mortgage.